Good. All right. Well, we have um, ticked over just after 10 o'clock and obviously people can continue to join us, but I will make a start. Um, you might have noticed already that uh, we are recording the session, um, that uh, we do record these sessions for people that can't make it. And we also provide a transcript later on uh, to support that as well. So just so you are all aware. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Leanne McNeil and those have, that have come along to the In Conversation series previously um, will have, I guess, seen my face and, and heard my voice before uh, in these sessions. Uh, I'm the General Manager for Opus Centre here in the Australia and New Zealand uh, region, so welcome to you all. Uh, I'll introduce our guest today. Uh, Michael comes to us uh, as an occupational hygienist. Um, and he's worked in that field for over 30 years in a variety of different roles, uh, both in the private and public sector. I'll come back to that in a little moment because I'll tell you a little bit about how Michael and I came to meet, which is a great segue into sort of handing the session over to him. Um, but before I do, just a couple of other little bits and pieces that help us uh, make these webinars flow really um, smoothly. We've been using the chat function to date, which is okay, but what we would ask is throughout the session, it's actually our preference to use the Q&A button. So if you have a look along the bottom of your screen, you should have a Q&A button. Um, what that means is those questions come to me rather than directly to Michael, and it just enables me to some, in some ways consolidate those questions um, and facilitate those into our conversation today. So rather than use the chat function, uh, try and use the Q&A function if you can. Um, I've mentioned that it's recorded, so that's great. Um, Michael will also ask some questions of you today in different uh, settings. So please to also provide any responses to those through the Q&A as well, that would be great. All right. Without any further ado then, um, I've given you a basic introduction to who the lovely Michael Lewis is. Good sense of humour, I will add to all of his other repertoire of, uh, of qualifications that were shared in, in advertising this session. But um, Michael and I met uh, through my previous involvement with local government. Uh, we had become concerned given some of the media reports around silicosis and what we were seeing happening to people that you know, in particular worked in that stonemason uh, industry. And as a result, we involved Michael uh, in some testing and some work in our cemeteries with some really surprising results. So Michael, I might just hand straight over to you and take it from there. Fantastic, thanks very much for Leanne. Mm. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Leanne says, I'm a, I'm a principal occupational hygienist to work at Simtars, which is the Safety of Mines Testing and Research Station. Uh, I've worked in a range of different fields, uh, both uh, in Australia and in New Zealand and private and government organisations. And my original qualification was registered nurse. So I've actually now come over into occupational hygiene, looking more at health prevention, if you like, and investigating causes of potential disease. Now, um, Brisbane City Council, as Leanne said, was actually uh, concerned about the potential or if there was a potential for silicosis risk. And uh, the, the very first job we went out to, we had a look at the site, but wasn't entirely sure if there was going to be a risk um, as was stated, but certainly to try to identify what the potential sources of exposure were. And I took out some sampling equipment and we put it on a range of different operators on the day. And uh, it was quite surprising the results that we got back, actually, the things that we thought were going to be a problem didn't turn out to be. The ones that was actually completely left of field was uh, rather surprising. So what I'm going to do is actually try and share this uh, the slide with you. So just give us two secs. Um, how do I do that again? Sorry. Uh, I do apologize. Can you? Got your share screen button. That's the one. Thank you very much. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on, share screen button. There we go. Right. It can take a little second for it to come up. Here it comes. It's starting to load now. Okay. So you guys can see that well enough? I certainly can. Yep. Okay. So um, for those of you who don't know what an occupational hygienist is, um, 
uh, there's a couple of things that we're not. Uh, we don't clean your teeth, so we're not dental hygiene technicians. Uh, we don't teach you how to wash your hands, and we certainly don't investigate or uh, inspect food premises. We are, uh, for want of a better way to describe it, uh, industrial forensic scientists. So we go out into the field with a range of instruments trying to answer a question about what the potential exposures happen to be and uh, come back to you with a quantifiable data to explain what we've actually discovered. So what I'm going to be covering off is actually a very brief thing. It's actually looking at unseen risks in uh, cemeteries, crematorium, funeral homes. Now, I have a little bit of uh, background knowledge in the, the industry. Uh, I used to be a senior inspector with Workplace Health and Safety Queensland up in Townsville. And I do remember back in the early 2000s, Workplace Health and Safety Queensland actually did an audit of the funeral industries across Queensland, just to have a look and see what uh, uh, the relative risks are and to, uh, to clarify whether the industry itself was actually aware of the then being generated code of practice. So the session outline we're gonna cover off, we're gonna talk about general discussion about known hazards as it was listed in the code of practice. Now, uh, what I found interesting when I was doing a search trying to find a similar code um, didn't have a lot of success in actually uh, finding um, workplace, health, or workplace health and safety centered risk codes for the funeral industry. In fact, if you do a search on the net nearly all the time, the Queensland code comes up. There's a couple of other bits and pieces from other jurisdictions, but mainly the Queensland code seems to be uh, the, the preeminent point source of, of discussion. Now, what we're going to be covering off is so the, we're going to have a look at the hazards that are actually listed in that code of practice, and some of those shouldn't come as a surprise. You've been working in the industry for a while, and I suggest that you probably know most of these anyway. Uh, if you haven't, you might be aware that they're actually in the background or part of the industry. And they're going to have a look at observations that come about from conducting respirable dust and inhalable dust monitoring at the cemeteries and crematoria at the Brisbane City Council area. And as a result of a question that was raised by BCC, do we have a risk for silicosis? Now, the findings, as I said, were essentially unremarkable. We didn't think, or I didn't think at the time actually we were walking around, even when we were putting the pumps on, that there was gonna be a problem. But when we got the results back, there was actually one particular group that was actually uh, uh, not part of the, the original discussion, if you like, or not part of the, the the original scope of work uh, that come back with an exceedance. And it was really quite interesting trying to explain how that come about. So common hazards in the fuel industry, and I would suggest that uh, most of you would actually be aware of this in one form or another, uh, the manual tasks, obviously, uh, you know, moving the, uh, uh, the remains around, we're actually doing the, uh, uh, the burial processes, uh, moving the coffins, everything else, uh, preparing the bodies. Uh, lifting, pushing, pulling, carrying, raising, and lowering. So they are uh, a significant risk, obviously, from manual handling tasks. You're actually uh, carrying weights that are essentially non-compliant. They, they don't really, uh, uh, you've got uh, decent grips, different handles, maybe moving around, you may be using hoists and lowering devices, et cetera, but it still is actually a, a difficult weight to actually control and move. Infectious diseases are certainly a common thing in all healthcare industries, and I would consider the, the funeral industry uh, to be a part of the, the healthcare environment. Um, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, they were the common ones that we would actually find in the healthcare industry. But of course, these days we've actually got this additional challenge of COVID-19. So the, the, the SARS variant that is actually coming up and the various mutations that are coming from that. Um, I have actually found some advice in regards to uh, suggested actions to take when you're dealing with a potentially infectious or COVID-19 uh, deceased person, um, but it's only really come from one jurisdiction. I, I couldn't find a lot else actually around the place, so it was, it was rather interesting what I managed to find. Hazardous chemicals, um, and I have to uh, advise you that I am, uh, this is my Pachant. I deal with basically chemicals management programs essentially. But uh, embalming fluids, uh, some of the old formaldehyde-based products uh, that was actually replaced by glutaraldehyde and glycols. Um, there can be cytotoxic drugs actually still present in the system. They can be around for quite some time. Uh, some of the cleaning agents that you might be using uh, to uh, prepare the body prior to uh, uh, burial or cremation. 
um, wood dusts when you're actually either manufacturing or actually making changes to um, the, uh, the the coffins, whatever, or actually uh, you're making available um, receptacles to actually uh, bring the body to. Um, poisons. Now, this might sound a little bit strange, but if you have somebody that is actually uh, passed through uh, ingestion, ingestion, either uh, intentional or unintentional poisons, they can still exist for quite some time afterwards. Uh, dusts coming from the uh, you know, manufacturing the memorials or actually drilling the benches to actually put down the plaques or even the cremation services themselves, the cremation products, they can all be potential hazardous chemicals or hazardous materials that are actually come into play. Now, from an occupational hygiene point of view, the main route of exposure for any external um, hazardous chemical or substance is through inhalation. So if you're looking at things like cytotoxic drugs, cleaning agents, wood dust, et cetera, it is whether these products are actually in the atmosphere and whether you can actually inhale them uh, or they're actually part of the overall environment. Work-related violence and aggression. Uh, let's face it, the, the industry itself, uh, it's, a, it's a very challenging time for the family. It's a very challenging time for those that actually attend the funeral. Uh, there's a lot of emotions uh, in, in play at the time. There, there might be some questions about how did this happen, what went on. And those heightened sense of awareness can sometimes lead to physical or psychological injuries uh, for the people actually working in the industry. Maybe going into a site where you're actually picking up uh, a deceased person and there's actually been a significant amount of trauma involved. Um, fatigue, working you know, long hours or actually working after hours, um, possible trauma. These are all things that come about. And the interesting thing about it is that uh, over the last couple of years, there has actually been now authentic discussions about occupational health related disease conditions, which includes psychosocial. So they're looking at fatigue management, they're looking at uh, psychological injury, they're looking at uh, uh, psychosocial stresses that occur in the industries across the board. So they're actually looking at the whole person, not just looking at safety related incidents. Physical hazards can be noise, it can be vibration. This is actually maybe operating the plant equipment to actually dig the graves or to actually move, uh, move equipment or um, even set up graveside uh, uh, materials using the vehicles, for instance. Uh, heat stress, let's face it, it actually operates all year round. Uh, heat stress, UV radiation, particularly during the hotter, hotter summer months, can actually be a real problem. Um, radioactive or radiation, radioactive devices. Now, it's not unusual uh, for people to actually have, um, say, uh, radioactive implants actually put in things like the, uh, the, the prostate gland or inside the body, what have you, to actually uh, create a point source treatment for cancers. Um, unless they're actually removed, they could still be there and they can still be active. They can be still active for quite some time. Uh, unstable memorials. Um, I'm sure all of you would have actually seen um, you know, uh, grave sites or graveyards, what have you, where the memorials have actually been there for a number of years. And they either ground has moved or there's actually been storms or whatever going through. And the, the memorials are actually leaning at a precarious angle and they could actually fall over. So there's actually, uh, as you can see, there's actually, these are the more common hazards that Workplace Health and Safety Queensland have actually identified and actually listed in their code of practice. But by no means is this an exhaustive list. I'm sure that uh, uh, if we had a, a longer time to discuss this, you, uh, your members would actually be able to come up with a range of other hazards that they've found in their time in the industry, both uh, emerging and you know, past ones that have come through. Now, you see there are actually the hazardous substances or hazardous chemicals. I've actually put an asterisk against it. There is actually four airborne contaminants, so all forms of air airborne contaminants. There are actually workplace exposure standards that apply. Now, these are actually standards that uh, uh, they're not safe, um, uh, you know, safe, unsafe standards. They're not go, no go standards. They just basically state that if you're exposed to the substance, over a period of an eight hour day or a 40 hour week, um, that the chances of actually developing any form of adverse health effects is actually greatly reduced. And WorkSafe Australia is the, uh, the preeminent body that actually holds uh, the database for the workplace exposure standards. And what I've actually done is I've gone through and did a search on some of the chemicals or some of the substances that may apply to the funeral industry. 
Now, obviously, the first question itself was asked about quartz, otherwise known as respirable. You know, in the respirable dust range, it can be known as silica, it can be known as respirable crystalline silica. There's certainly been some significant changes in recent times about the exposure standard for that. And if you can actually have a look there, it says the time weighted average, which is actually an eight hour day, 40 hour week exposure, you cannot be exposed to anything more average of 0 0.05 milligrams per meter cubed. And that's not a lot. That really isn't a lot out there. Um, respirable dust itself is actually um, uh, any dust that actually are within the respirable range. And these are dust that will actually get down into the alveolar region, the gas exchange region of the lungs. And they can cause some form of disease process, a fibrogenic disease process. I've certainly seen in the time that I've actually been uh, working as an occupational hygienist, respirable quartz or respirable crystalline silica has at least halved in certainly the last two years. There is a suggestion that it may actually halve again in the not too distant future. So if you're looking at it, 0 0.025 milligrams per meter cubed, that's not much of anything. And the interesting thing about it is that respirable dust itself is actually, you can't typically see it. The dust that you do see is actually more or less in the inhalable range, which is actually 100 microns uh, or less. Respirable crystalline silica, it starts at 10 microns. So it's actually quite fine. Potential sources could actually be scraping the, 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 the chromate or refractory bricks, depending on what the bricks happen to be made of, if they've actually got silica on them, and some of them may do. Uh, the cremations themselves, you know, there might be some respirable dust in there, and so we'll, we'll cover off on the, uh, the potential exposures there in, in, in a short while. Uh, backfilling your graves with decomposed granite. Now, the bit of a hint here is actually just keep, an, uh, just keep that in the back of your mind, decomposed granite that is actually used for backfilling. Glutaraldehyde. Well, glutaraldehyde itself was actually, many years ago, was actually seen as a safer alternative to formaldehyde. Um, I remember that uh, formaldehyde itself uh, back in 2004 uh, went from a group 2A probable human carcinogen to a group one known human carcinogen and through not only the funeral industry but also the uh, pathology in industries and oddly enough the construction industry into a tailspin because if you have a look at things like uh, uh, laminated beams that are used in the building industry they actually use formaldehyde glue to actually tie it all together it's a very good um, um, activating uh, agent now you can see there that I've suggested that it's actually in the embalming fluids and certain, certainly some of the older embalming fluids actually had uh, formaldehyde in them. Um, the time weighted average for that, if you have a look at it, there's actually two standards that are basically the same, 0.1 parts per million. Again, that's not much in the atmosphere, okay? Now glutaraldehyde, I remember actually using that stuff back in the 1980s as a cold sterilant for uh, endoscopes in urology theater in Wellington Hospital. And I used to make the stuff. I used to actually pour it into a tray, put in the powder as the activator stirred up and it would actually be in an open, uh, open tray sitting on the bench. We'd actually soak the scopes in there. You couldn't do that these days. They have to actually be inside in basically an enclosed booth or ventilated booth. See formaldehyde there. Again, you can see this is a, there's a significant difference actually between the two. Formaldehyde is one part per million, glutaraldehyde is 0.1 parts per million. And the, the difference between the two of them, the glutaraldehyde, it says peak limitation. If you exceed that limit just once, it doesn't have to be an average, that's it, no more exposure, everybody go home. Formaldehyde, however, is a slightly different case. You, there is an average concentration over the course of the day, it'll either be one part per million for uh, an eight hour day. The STEL is an interesting one, it is a what's known as a short-term exposure limit. So you typically, the way that it works is that you're exposed to the substance for 15 minutes. Then you have an hour break away from it. You don't go anywhere near it. Then another 15 minutes, another hour, another 15 minutes, another hour, another 15 minutes, and that's it. That's the end of the day. So it's four 15-minute periods in the course of a day. And you can't exceed those concentrations that are actually listed there. And again, two parts per million or 2.5 milligrams per meter cubed is not a lot in the atmosphere. You can see there that it's actually also listed as a, a carcinogen 1B, which is basically, it's an older classification, but it means it's actually a carcinogen or it's, it will cause cancer in human beings with exposure over a period of time. Now, the, um, 
the disease associated with it could actually be short term or long term. It depends on the concentration, but it can take between 10 and 30 years before you actually start developing some or most disease processes associated with chemicals in the atmosphere. Again, it's actually used in embalming fluids and it's typically mixed with methanol and it comes as a form uh, as a uh, uh, material known as formalin. Sodium hydroxide. This is actually a relative new one. It was actually probably about a, about a month ago, I was actually called uh, by somebody who was looking at doing green cremations. Uh, it's something I hadn't heard of before, but they were saying that they actually have basically a process chamber. Um, they, they put the body into the chamber. They actually have a high concentration of sodium hydroxide, which is basically an, a very strong alkaline solution. Drain cleaner is actually a, a form of it, if you like. And so uh, they leave the, uh, the body in there and it's basically a very advanced uh, or very fast decomposition under a chemical environment. Now, um, I was talking to Leanne before actually, I don't, um, I don't think there's actually much in the way of green cremation is actually doing here in Australia. I'll stand corrected on that obviously, because I'm not working in the industry. But certainly it's actually something that has gained uh, popularity overseas where they're actually worried about the, uh, you know, the potential off gases from cremations, what have you, and they want to try and find something that is essentially a greener alternative. Uh, the material that's actually left over after the, uh, the um, uh, sodium hydroxide has done its stuff, there's some bone left over, it's been completely denatured. The rest of the organic material itself is basically just flushed down the drain, you get strained away from the container. And then the bones, I believe, are actually treated exactly the same way as they are for cremators, where they're actually put through a cremulator and actually crushed and ready for, for uh, passing on to the, to the, uh, to the family. A uh, phenol, or phenol uh, can actually be part of a phenol formaldehyde compound. It's actually, again, it's an embalming fluid, ethylene glycol, uh, and it's also an embalming fluid. Oddly enough, ethylene glycol is the same stuff you use as antifreeze in your radiator of your car. Um, so you can see there, it actually has a significantly higher uh, time-weighted average as compared to things like glutaraldehyde. Uh, rogue dust. Now, rogue dust itself is actually a general term that is used for dusts uh, in the inhalable range. So this is once you can actually see, and uh, it's actually uh, dust that are actually less than 100 microns, 10 milligrams per meter cubed as an average. Now dust themselves are not really classified. They just say the dust that, that could be from the cremator or cremulator, uh, could be servicing of the, uh, the cremulator tweers. So when they're actually doing service and maintenance of the the furnaces and the air injection systems actually getting in there and cleaning out some of the dust and whatever they were actually left behind. And in some cases, some of the dust that are actually uh, generated during the either the digging of the grave or backfilling the grave or even actually backfilling after it's been settled for a while. So it covers a whole range of different types of dusts. That long winded one, uh, the, the next one, I'm not even going to attempt to actually pronounce that. I can tell you if you, could, if you guys can, fantastic. Um, but basically, it's a methylene glycol. Again, it's actually an embalming fluid um, uh, as a liquid, right? And then you've actually got the vapor that comes from off the ethylene glycol. And you can see there are actually two significant differences there. One is actually 16 milligrams per meter cubed, and the other one is 52 milligrams per meter cubed. So you can see it's actually raising in concentrations depending on the type of things, uh, the type of products that are being used. Um, methanol. Oddly enough, again, it's, a, uh, it's an embalming fluid. It's, it's a known poison. Um, if you come in contact with this stuff, it can actually cause it. Well, if you actually drink it, for instance, you can actually end up with blindness, that sort of thing. Um, it, but it's actually got a atmospheric concentration of the vapor of 262 milligrams per meter cubed. And it also has a stell quite high, um, but it, I don't think you would actually typically be using methanol in isolation. It will like, be part of the formaldehyde. When you apply in these standards, you actually apply the one that actually has the greatest risk. Uh, if you have uh, uh, formalin products, for instance, you would actually use formaldehyde as the, uh, the exposure standard, not methanol. So even though the methanol is there, the formaldehyde actually drives the system, if you like. Now, if you have a look down the bottom of the table there, it actually shows the different types of classifications. Um, these are actually relatively up to date. Uh, IARC stands for uh, the International Agency for Research on Cancer. They're actually part of the World Health Organization and they produce what's known as monographs. So they have a look at the data that's available for different types of chemicals and they classify those chemicals in four different groups 
depending on their potential to cause cancer in human beings. Now, literally out of the thousands of chemicals that are actually used in industry, um, so far there's actually 121 substances that are unknown human carcinogens. Uh, there are 89 substances that are actually uh, probable human carcinogens, 319 that are possible human carcinogens. So that can, both of those are actually either class, uh, classed on limited human data or animal trials or um, cellular um, trials. And group three, 500 agents, they've been looked at. They're not classified as carcinogenic to humans. Doesn't mean that they're not, uh, uh, they don't have some health effects. It's just something that cause cancer. Now, I've got a question for the team. Got everybody out there. I've got six pictures up there at the moment, and we're just thinking about dusts, okay? What I would like you to do is actually have a look at those six pictures and tell me which one do you think actually has the highest dust risk? Okay. I'm monitoring both the chat and the Q&A, Michael, to see what comes through. Okay. Nobody's gaming up yet by the looks. <laughs> okay, so describe me what Vash you got there. The, the... Um, Irene says B. B, okay. Yeah, All I've right. got a C as well. Someone says C. So B and C at the minute. Okay. <laughs> yep. Yep, right. that seems pretty consistent. Yep. B and C. Okay. You were surprised that you're wrong. <laughs> Now, the reason why I say that actually, okay, so what we got there is actually we've got A is actually drilling a concrete bench to actually put down the plaques. Now, the, the, the guys there are actually drilling it with just an impact drill, and afterwards they actually blow it out with a, with a, with a handheld battery operated blower. Okay. B itself, yes, there can be a risk with that. That is actually drilling, obviously, a monument stone or a monument headstone. But what you may not be aware of is that the, uh, they're actually doing point source extraction. So that little vacuum cleaner that he's got in the hand is actually connected to a device that's got a H-class filter. So a H-class filter is actually one's designed for toxic dusts, asbestos, silicosis, lead dust, that sort of carry on. So yes, there can be some dust actually generated drilling the drilling the thing, but they've got it under significant control. They're actually sucking it up at point source as it's been generated and been removed from the environment. So there's very little of any actually released into the atmosphere. C, yes, it is a dusty job. And in fact, uh, if you can have a look there, uh, you will actually see there's a, a pump on the gentleman's belt. There's some tubes coming up. I've actually got the sampling head right up near his breathing zone. Um, we did uh, respirable dust and inhalable dust while they're actually doing out the, the, the cleaning out of the, of the furnace just to see if there was actually anything come up. Uh, D and E are obviously the, uh, the alpha and omega of uh, the burial. So it's actually uh, initially uh, digging the grave itself, actually uh, pulling the dirt out of the ground. And E is actually returning the, uh, the, the dirt to the ground after the coffin's actually been laid uh, to rest. F is actually uh, lawn mowing just simply running across the lawns, uh, keeping, the, uh, uh, keeping the grove out actually looking nice, you know, keeping it basically pristine. You'd be surprised to know that the one that actually has the highest risk is the lawnmower. Now, this actually really surprised both of us, actually. I mean, it, uh, both uh, myself and Leanne were actually left scratching ahead. How did this happen? What was the story? So what you've got there is actually the, the test results that are actually done. And I'd have to advise you, this is actually limited data. So it's actually, um, I think we did about half a dozen different grave sites to, or half a dozen different graveyards. And we took some samples and this one was actually, this particular site was actually the one that flagged up the, uh, the, the lawnmower operation. So drilling concrete benches. And if you have a look down the body, we can actually see the workplace exposure hazard. Now, the interesting thing in Australia at the moment, um, respirable dust itself, right, doesn't have a workplace exposure standard. There is actually one on, on Safe Work Australia, but it's actually dealing with respirable dusts that are coal less than 5% quartz. The exposure standard there of three milligrams per meter cubed is actually sourced from the ACGIH, which is the American Congress of Governmental and Industrial Hygienists. So we apply that to general workplaces. There are respirable dust uh, exposure standards for coal mines and there are ones for metal mines and quarries, but nothing really for general workplaces. So 
Centaurs itself have actually adopted the ACGIH standard in the absence of any other information. So we do a bit of a comparison there. Green means good. Orange, okay, warning Will Robinson, we've got a bit of a problem. Red, okay, this is a bit of a problem. We need to investigate it. So if you have a look there, drilling the concrete benches, so just simply just drilling it out in the open, uh, there was 0 0.03 milligrams per meter cubed of respirable dust. Anything that's actually less than 0 0.03 on crystalline silica means it's actually below the limit of reporting from the laboratory. So there was there was not much there at all in, in respirable crystalline silica. The same thing with drilling the marble bench rests. Okay, uh, again, partly that would have been due to the exposure being controlled through the use of the vacuum cleaner. The other part would have been there wasn't a hell of a lot of dust actually being generated when doing the drilling. It was actually quite well controlled and it wasn't being drilled using air or anything on those lines. So what little was being actually generated was very large sized particles that are actually immediately deposited just on the outside of the hole. Cleaning the ashes from the cremulator or the cremator, sorry. Okay, the inhalable dust was 1.33. Now, what that suggests to me is that, yes, there is actually inhalable dust generated by scraping the stuff out. Now, inhalable dust themselves, as I say, are dust that are 100 micron or less. Respirable dust is less than 10 microns. We've got you know, a slightly higher level of 0 0.05 milligrams per meter cubed for respirable dust. And again, there was actually nothing there, crystalline silica. Okay, so that's good. Processing the ashes, I actually uh, followed the person around when they were actually doing this. This is a different site. And there was a little bit of uh, um, inhalable dust when they were actually uh, processing the ashes, getting them ready, uh, uh, removing metal implants, if you like, from the bones of what's left over and actually putting in the cremulator and, and basically putting into the container. So there was a little bit of dust generated during the process, and that was certainly evident in the area. Again, the respirable dust itself was comparable, okay, and there was no crystalline silicon there. The difference between uh, the cleaning the ashes and the processing the ashes is actually a slightly different analytical method, but even still less than 0 0.01 milligrams per meter cube. There was nothing there. Okay. Digging the grave. Yeah, there was a little bit coming out of that. Um, the, the soil was actually relatively dry. There was a little bit of dampness in it, but again, not much in the respirable dust range. In fact, there was not much dust itself actually be generated at all. Filling the grave. Very similar, slightly higher because the stuff's actually dried out a little bit. And obviously when they're pouring it in, it actually has a chance to you know, generate some dusts. But the, the concentrations themselves were actually taken from the workers. He was actually sitting inside the cabin of uh, the dump truck and or the excavator at the time. So the risk of exposure to dust is actually incredibly low. Mowing the lawns, however, was actually a different thing. We got not a lot, it was sort of over half of the relative exposure standard for respirable dust, so 1.69. So anything that's greater than 50%, we actually uh, call the action zone. So it needs to be investigated to find out what the cause is, what's going on here. Respirable crystalline silica was very high, 0.11 milligrams per meter cubed. And it was that one that actually got uh, both myself and Leanne and the rest of the team scratching their heads, trying to work out what was going on had to do a little bit of uh, forensic investigation. That's it's probably the best way to describe it. And what we managed to find out through discussions is that on occasion, when the grave is actually settling, you end up obviously with a, with a dip in the lawn. They were actually back filling that dip with decomposed granite, okay? Or rotten rockets, it's otherwise known as. It's actually been bought in from a quarry um, as, as additional soil, if you like, for the site. And they were actually you know, gently spreading it by shovel over the top of this thing. And actually, you know, it, it's very good. It actually compacts down. It actually doesn't really move too far. It's a relatively stable material. In fact, it's actually used on things like uh, uh, some garden paths around the place. It was actually used on uh, you know, backfilling holes around the site, that sort of carry on. What we managed to work out, what we believe was happening, is that when the lawnmower is actually going over the top of it, when the stuff is being used for backfill, it's actually relatively damp. But after it's been sitting around for a while, it actually dry. The lawnmower goes over the top of it. And lawnmowers, by their very nature, have a great way of actually picking up dust from off the ground and spreading it evenly and finely divided across the countryside. The lawnmower operator themselves was actually been exposed to high concentrations of dust that were containing very high levels of crystalline silica. And when we actually had a look at the, the percent content 
of the courts that was actually in there. It was about 6%. So what you learn from that is you don't need to have a lot of respirable dust to actually have high levels of respirable crystalline silica. Now, obviously, this is actually something that needs to be looked at to find out what's going on. Um, and to be aware that if you're bringing in products then that could potentially have quartz in it, if you don't know, ask the supplier, get them to provide you a safety data sheet for the product so you know what you're dealing with, or at the very least, a thing called a petrographic analysis, which is actually something that's done by, done by geologists. They will actually have a look at where this stuff's coming from, typically from the quarries, and they will give you a rough idea what percent quartz happens to exist. So out of all of the activities that are going on, that one was certainly the most surprising out of the lot. Now, touching briefly on COVID-19, and I have to profess that I'm not actually uh, a um, microbiology expert, so I'm, I'm taking this at face value. I try to find some information actually about how COVID-19 could potentially affect the funeral industry or what, uh, what is coming about. And let's face it, there's, it's not going to go away anytime soon. There's certainly going to be uh, challenges actually faced with people that actually have COVID-19 or have passed from COVID-19. What is the risk to you? What could be the potential controls that you need to put into place? Now, I did a search again on the net, just casting around to see what I could find. And I actually found this advice from the office of the Australian Capital Territory Chief Health Officer that was issued June last year. So this is general advice. Maintain standard droplet and con uh, contact information, uh, contact infection control procedures when the handling of transporting bodies confirmed or suspected to have COVID-19. I would suggest that you probably be doing that anyway. If you're picking up somebody that has an unknown infectious state, you certainly want to make sure that you're not exposed to any potentially exhaled particles that may actually be coming from the person. And certainly they may mention that if they're actually moving the person around, there is a very strong possibility that they may exhale just simply from moving, uh, moving the body or reposition them and getting them onto a trolley, whatever. Wear appropriate personal protective equipment at all times. Now, as it stands at the moment, the masks that we were wearing for um, protection in the field, you know, just the general paper masks, they're really only there to actually stop you from coughing at someone else. If you're looking at trying to protect yourself against potential inhalation, you really need to be wearing what's equivalent to a P2 mask. It doesn't have the exhalation valve on it, but it actually fits on your face a little, a little bit better and it provides you slightly better protection against any airborne droplets. They were suggesting that you actually lose, uh, that you possibly double bag a, uh, a body with a leak proof body bag and put on a label on the outside say COVID-19 handle with care. And that should be used for actually the storage and transport of the body. I'm not entirely sure if that's the case that you guys are doing the moment, but this is the advice that they actually uh, uh, suggested. And avoid unnecessary manipulation of the body that may expel air or fluid from the lungs. If an airway, uh, like a, a ventilator airway, um, an endotracheal tube uh, is still in place, and sometimes the, you know, the medical devices are actually left in situ, um, they suggest that maybe put a tape, a bit of tape actually over, the, over the, um, the airway hole to prevent air from actually being expelled into the environment as you're moving the, uh, the, the person around and moving the body around. They can't confirm at the time whether the embalming of the body um, is actually going to have any significant effect or if there's going to be you know, increased risk of exposure to COVID-19. So at the time, until they actually had something to, to, the, uh, to the contrary, they suggested that maybe embalming is not something that should be done. That's interesting. Family viewing the deceased may occur. However, family members should avoid contact with the body. Um, again, this is actually a difficult place to be. You know, the, the family members may wish to view the body. They may actually be uh, preparing the body for burial. You know, different cultural uh, practices and what have you may require them to actually interact with the deceased person. How you prevent them from actually being exposed to potential COVID-19. You could suggest that they wear a mask when they're actually working with a person, but again, it's, it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis about how you're going to do it. And maintaining recommended social distancing from friends and family with deceased. Let, let's face it, in the last two years, it's been very challenging. There have been uh, limited numbers at funerals. There have been limited numbers at gravesides. Uh, some have actually been delayed either through COVID shutdowns, what have you. So um, I think you would find that COVID-19 itself is actually still very much a moving feast in regards to advice and, and guidance. 
ultimately it's just try to prevent exposure to any aerosols that may actually be expelled from the deceased person and to protect yourself in, in, against any potential exposure, particularly if you're collecting a person who has recently passed from COVID-19. The sources that are actually going together as part of the presentation, and these are just a couple of examples of things I've pulled up. Obviously, the, the Guide to the Funeral Industry, which is from Workplace Health and Safety Queensland, that's, that's one of the source documents. Uh, you can see there, there's actually the COVID-19 Guidance for Funeral Industry Workers that come from out of the Chief Health Officer and the ACT. Again, if you haven't got a copy of it, do a search, find it, have a look at it, see if the practices themselves apply to you and whether they're actually appropriate for your business or not. Having a look overseas, actually, to see if there's actually any uh, more comprehensive, if you like, advice. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration from Oregon in the US have actually got this guide, Occupational Health and Safety in the Death Care Industry. It's quite comprehensive, actually. It sort of goes on, if you like, into a little more detail and offers potential control mechanisms that the guide to the funeral industry from here uh, may not necessarily address or discuss. The other one itself is actually an article that I found that actually talks about mortal exposures. And it's actually talking about a range of potential biological, chemical uh, exposures uh, that may come about from actually just working in the funeral industry alone and discuss the relative risks associated with the handling or proximity to uh, the, the substances or the person when you're actually working in the industry. As a final thing, Simtars itself, uh, this is actually the web page for Simtars. Uh, we are part of the Queensland Government. We're part of Resources Safety and Health Queensland. Uh, uh, Resources Safety and Health Queensland is actually now a statutory body. So we're actually no longer part of, the, we're no longer a department, but we are still part of the Queensland Government. That being said, Simtars itself is actually a fee-for-service organisation. So we operate like a private consultancy. And we do with a range of different industries. And if you have a look there, you'll actually see my smiling ever to, uh, ever, uh, face actually helping out the training services side of things in the back in the days we used to wear bow ties. Um, there are a range of different services and make available. And certainly if you've got any questions or in the occupational health or hygiene space, um, I'd, I'd be happy enough to actually field those questions through Leanne or you can contact us directly through the Simtars Inquiry line. Thank you for your time. So, Michael, I have had a couple of questions and comments made throughout um, your session. I'm um, mm -hmm. just going back to COVID-19. Fiona asked, um, uh, obviously, there were risks at the time of moving the body, uh, you know, making funeral arrangements. Uh, what about if there was an exhumation of a, uh, a body that potentially that, that was believed to have died from COVID-19? Exhumation risks? Yeah, look, I think... I don't know if they've actually really got a handle on exactly how long the virus itself actually lasts outside the body. I mean, as it stands at the moment, um, you know, viruses themselves by their very nature actually need to have a living host to actually be maintained and they can survive outside the body for periods of time. Um, a classic example is uh, hepatitis. You know, it, it is a form of virus that can actually lay dormant for a number of years. COVID-19 itself, I don't know yet whether we've actually got any significant data about the viability of COVID-19 virus outside of the human body. And if there is actually uh, data or evidence, how long it would be? Would it be two mm. days, three weeks, 24 hours? Really don't know. Um, to, I would suggest that you probably want to treat the exhumation as you would any other potentially infectious uh, material substance. You know, provide yourself a level of protection. You know, obviously the risk of exposure itself is through inhalation only. So if you're wearing a mask, if you're protecting yourself against the, the dusts or biologicals or radiologicals, whatever else may actually occur as part of the exhumation process, you've got a pretty good chance of actually you know, preventing potential exposure. Yeah. COVID is certainly one of those things I think we'll be learning about yet for sort of years, years to come. Very much so. It's it yeah. is still very much a moving feast. I mean, it's uh, you have a look now. COVID is actually um, it's mutating rather quickly. Um, mm. There are actually a number of variants out there that uh, are showing up um, more rapidly than we probably originally uh, originally thought. Certainly, the World Health Organization at the very beginning actually said that this virus was actually not demonstrating mutation. I think what was happening mm. was is that it was mutating so quickly that they couldn't actually pick up the individual genotypes quick enough. Yeah. So we're in that yeah. space now, basically. Yeah. 
Um, a question was also asked um, sort of fairly on early on when you were talking about those different risks across the industry more broadly. Somebody asked about the risk of asbestos in older crypts. Uh, obviously, if there's crypts being reopened or uh, there might be an exhumation, um, these crypts are being reopened. Thoughts about asbestos risk? It depends on how the asbestos has actually been uh, presented. I mean, if it's actually been used as like an insulation rope, Okay, if it's actually like a seal that's actually pressed into the outside edges of uh, the, the, the crypt face, um, you can end up with a thing called friable asbestos, which is actually where the dusts or the fibers themselves can be released into the atmosphere with very little uh, disturbance. So there, there's a potential risk there of exposure to friable asbestos. If, however, it's actually been used as part of a mortar, right, or a cement, the chances of actually releasing dust into the atmosphere is actually quite low, as long as you're not using any form of mechanical generation. Now we're talking about things like you know, grinders or chipping hammers. Jack hammers. Sort of yeah. Yeah. So if you're actually generating large amounts of dust as a result, you know, quick cut saws or that sort of kind, there is an increased risk of exposure to dusts and certainly increased risk of exposure to whatever happens to be in the cements like asbestos. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, uh, we've gone back to COVID actually, a, a question yeah. just come through and it, it's kind of a bit, uh, it's a longer one, so I'll run through it. Um, it. The comment is made if embalming is not allowed for COVID-19, and I'm not sure that it's not allowed, it's just not recommended, um, but what, what, if, what would then happen next? Is there a requirement specifically for the body to be buried or cremated? Are there any recommendations on that sort of front? Um, I think we've answered the question around uh, exhumation and around the safety um, for that. We, we really don't know how long this virus is going to live, um, despite the fact that it hasn't got a living host. But um, yeah, and I guess with those virus particles then um, move on to cremators, my understanding is the heat from a cremator would destroy most viruses, but I'm not sure if that's quite correct. So I don't know if you've got any comments about those. I think it'd be fair to say, actually, if you're looking at the cremation process itself, it's actually a rather clean process. Yeah. And as long as the body itself is actually when they're introduced into the cremator, basically in a sealed container or a sealed coffin or body bag, whatever it happens to be, the chances of any form of infectious material or any form of biological or chemical material being released prior to the body being put into the cremator is actually incredibly low. And obviously the temperatures and the, the withholding temperatures inside the cremator itself is likely to destroy and denature any form of organic material. That's basically the principle of it. Mm. So what's left over is essentially the minerals, the mineralogy in the shapes of bones, bone structures. The virus itself, I, I don't have a lot of information about the virus, about its viability outside mm. of the human host. I don't, I don't think we actually really got a handle on that at the moment. Certainly the, um, the principle is that you actually treat any potential body fluids as infectious. Yeah. And that's, that's general principles. That's been around for quite a few years, actually, certainly in the nursing and healthcare profession. If there's anything that's coming from out of a person, you have to treat it potentially as infectious and you take the necessary mm. precautions to do so. And you're doing that at the moment. Yeah. In regards to the embalming, you've got to remember that that, uh, that guidance document itself actually come from the Chief Health Officer out of the ACT early in the piece, and this is June last year, where they still didn't have quite a good handle on what the potential infection or transmission is coming from COVID, right? Or basically it's a SARS derivative, SARS virus derivative. And what they were suggesting is if there's, if you can decrease the risk of exposure to body fluids, to materials coming from the body in, a, in an untreated or un, um, uh, sterilized or sanitized state, that's probably the best option. I would suggest that if you're actually going to be doing in the embalming process, you would certainly want to be protecting yourself against any potential exposures to the vapors and things coming off the embalming fluid in the first place. If yeah. you're doing those, you're by very, very nature also providing protection against any potential biological materials that might be released as an aerosol into the atmosphere. Um, I've just had a couple of questions coming through, um, I guess, uh, about 
cremation um, about the radioactive nature of things. I've just asked Fiona to clarify a quick question that she's asked, but a comment was made, which I did respond to fairly early on in the piece about the risks of pacemakers uh, in, in cremators, you know, and the risk yeah. of explosion. And I know you and I've talked about this, Michael, but I also shared uh, with the person who asked the question um, that pacemakers are supposed to be removed by doctors prior to cremation. Although there are some modern ones now that are being tested and trialled um, because the belief is that they shouldn't explode uh, in a, a cremator. I don't know if you've got any experience around that. I, I have actually heard, uh, I haven't actually seen it for myself personally, but I have actually heard that, um, uh, particularly when we were doing the work originally, Leanne, you, actually, you yeah. guys were advising me that uh, any medical devices are supposed to have been removed from uh, the, the body prior to cremation, and a certificate was supposed to be provided to actually state that that had occurred. And it was mainly to do with things like, you know, heparin pumps or insulin pumps or any sort of battery operated device, including mm. uh, pacemakers. And the, the original thought process behind that was, is that because they actually have basically a long life lithium ion battery, that when they're subjected to very high heats and, uh, and temperatures for a long period of time, they will thermally decompose, basically, yeah. rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you end up with a bang going on inside the thing and you wonder what's going on. Now, certainly, um, if you have a look at, I would encourage your, uh, your, your team or your members to actually have a look at that advice from the ACT uh, Chief Health Officer, because I think they make mention in there, they suggest that maybe the pacemakers shouldn't be removed, mm. again, because they thought there might be any risk actually of exposure to uh, uh, you know, biological load actually coming Other. from COVID-19. Yeah, that's mm. right. So. I think that one, again, is actually, uh, it has to be a case-by-case -case basis. It really depends on um, what you will accept coming into the cremator. And certainly the industry standard of actually removing uh, devices from the body when it is possible, usually at the healthcare setting or in the funeral yeah. directors if they need to, is probably still appropriate. Until we've actually got a advice or guidance about whether the pacemakers themselves can actually go through a cremator without causing significant damage to the cremator or actually causing an adverse risk from uh, some sort of lithium ion uh, gas explosion or something uh, inside mm. the cremator, it's probably best to actually err on the side of the caution and actually look at trying to remove the devices to remove any potential risk. Yep. Yeah, you also talked about uh, radiation and, and uh, Fiona has asked, um, do seeds increase the radio risk, uh, radioactive risks during cremation? So those sorts of things implanted for the likes of prostate cancer. Um, they could possibly. The problem is with radioactive devices themselves or radioactive seeds, as you call them, is that they're actually still essentially active. Uh, when they're planted in the body, that's why they're there. Yeah. They're actually they're like a localized radiation source, you know, almost like a targeted um, radiotherapy. That's what they're designed to do. Now, ideally, these things would actually be removed before the, uh, the body's actually passed to the funeral directors, and there should be some sort of certificate to state that they have been done so. Um, probably the best thing to do is actually get in touch with the, the medical institution to find out if they've actually, what their control measures are, for somebody mm. who has deceased in regards to radioactive devices, do they remove them or at least try and find out what the, the source is? What is the potential risk to your team, your members actually? Is yeah. this actually likely to cause a, a radiation risk? It could be that the device itself uh, is actually have a very low radioactive potential but you probably, again, you, you don't want to be inhaling the dust. You know, that, that's the, yeah. the significant thing here. You don't want to actually inhale the material. Um, when it comes down to uh, radioactive devices or radiation, you know, risk of radiation, um, alpha particles are the ones that actually carry the greatest risk. Now, alpha particles are actually very large particles that have a high uh, radioactive load. And they're typically found in things like dusts, right? Mm. You have them land on your skin, not a problem. You might get a little bit of localized irritation. That's about it. But generally, it doesn't cause a concern. You inhale a, um, uh, you inhale a, a radioactive material or uh, an alpha particle. They're, they're relatively large size particles mm -hmm. compared to, to the other types. 
um, they can actually settle into the tissue and because they've actually got such a high energy, they can actually migrate through tissue over a long period of time and can actually cause localized chronic effect through inhalation. I, I was going to say, Michael, you, you, you know, you clearly talk about um, uh, inhalation and I know with my team, when we started to identify some of those risks, um, there were a range of different mask types that we did look at. Uh, I guess one of the reasons that we uh, at Opus put this in conversation on today was because October has been Safe Work Month. So we've got a few minutes remaining. Are there things, kind of broad things that um, our audience and, and those that they work with can and, and should be doing to kind of manage these inhalation risks? Yeah, very much so. I mean, if you're looking at different types of respiratory protective equipment, okay, so that you, you've got to take into account there's actually a significant shift in control hierarchy measures in the safety industry, and it's literally been in the last three, four months. In the past, personal protective equipment, administrative procedures were actually see the be all one end all. So when it comes down to things like point source ventilation, extraction systems, ventilation systems, um, isolation systems, high-end mm -hmm. engineering controls were very often not entertained because they were seen as being the too hard basket. I can advise your members now that the safety regulators are actually no longer accepting personal protective equipment as the be all and end all. It's a good interim measure, but they will be wanting you to explore higher order controls to prevent exposure. Now, if you uh, Brisbane City Council, they should actually be congratulated, actually, because mm -hmm. when we were looking at the uh, the guys that are actually doing the work uh, in the uh, at the cemetery, they were, and particularly the guy that was actually operating the lawnmower, which was actually encouraging. Yeah. He was yeah. actually wearing a PAPR, which is actually a very high order respiratory protective equipment. It's known as a purified air powered respirator. So it's actually a battery pack with two large size canisters. That actually draws air through the canisters up through a tube and plays it into a semi-sealed face mask like a face shield that sits over the top and it has a gusset around it and provides a positive pressure environment to prevent against exposure. PAPRs themselves can actually be used for toxic dusts, things like mm -hmm. asbestos, silicosis, etc. And depending on the type of cartridge you can put on, they can also be used for various types of chemicals. Right. So if you're looking at things like formaldehydes or those types of things, um, you can actually get a high absorption organic vapor cartridge that actually fit onto the PAPRs and it gives you purified air going past your face. Very good pieces of kit. Unfortunately, they're also relatively expensive. You know, you, it's, yeah. a, it's a significant investment. They do, however, offer a, uh, uh, an additional benefit that they actually provide uh, protection for the mucous membranes, so the eyes, the mm -hmm. mouth, the nose, whatever. So any potential splashes and everything, it actually hits a big, big, large plastic face shield, essentially. Yep, yep. Um, uh, I was going to say, you, you know, you talk about them, um, you know, yes, they're, they're certainly a costly piece of equipment, but I do talk very personally. I know there were members of my staff that said their lungs had never been so good, um, you know, after they, you know, that it had almost corrected uh, maybe some health problems that they'd had previously. Well, exactly. And the, the thing you've got to take into account as well, actually, there's an added benefit for using something that actually has a cartridge, whether it be a half face reusable respirator, a full face reusable respirator, or a PAPR. The cartridges themselves typically have a filter that is actually rated P3. Now, P3 yeah. itself is effective against biologicals. Viruses and bacteria, they will actually filter out viruses and bacteria. And certainly I remember back in the uh, early 2000s, uh, uh, one particular respirator company was actually trying to um, uh, provide full face masks with the organic vapor cartridges and the, the P3 filters on it to surgeons working in the orthopedic theaters mm. because it provided facial protection and also Everything. provided protection against yeah, the viruses and bacteria. So. Yep. I mean, if you were looking at a higher order control, you would actually be looking at something on those lines. A P2 disposable respirator, they are perfectly fine for, you know, low order controls, you know, you know, potential dust exposures, that sort of carry on. But I can tell you now, if you've actually got a face like mine, you've got a bit of fungus on it, it's not going to work. <laughs> All right, yeah. it's just going to lift off, it's just going to go straight past it. So you have to be clean yeah. shaver. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, all right, well, look, I am just conscious of time. Um, I, I just really, honestly, Michael, thank you so much um, for joining us today. I think everybody who works in this industry, you know, we know that there's risks uh, and mitigation strategies that we need to employ, but um, I don't think we ever truly know just how many risks uh, that they are. So thank you today for, for talking us through that. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the session has been recorded, so uh, we will be able to provide that uh, later to you all so you can share that within your organisations if you need to. Um, also, thank you to everybody that has joined us today. Some great questions. Um, it's certainly been a great session. Um, I would say... Um, that our In Conversation series will pretty much be taking a little break now until uh, the new year. So we certainly look forward to seeing you all again uh, in January. I did mention that one of the reasons that we ran this session today was because October has been Safe Work Month. But of course, safe work for our people doesn't start and end with the month of October. So uh, if Michael's session today has raised any questions for you, I guess, um, and things that you, you want to look at in your organisations, please don't hesitate to reach out. We can put you in contact with Michael or, of course, uh, you can contact Simtars yourself uh, directly. So thank you again, Michael, for your time time and thank you uh, to everybody out there in Zoom world. Take care guys and Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I'll see you when you get back in 2022. Thanks Michael. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.